Welcome to episode 7 of The Inside Job. Today's guest is Dr. Marvella Bowman, a psychologist and author who currently works with offenders in the prison system. In this episode, Dr. Bowman gives us an insight into what her career is like, as well as sharing tips in how to relax and de-stress, especially in today's difficult times. We hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Inside Job. Today, I am truly honored to have the author of Content, Consistent, and Conformed, Minister of Dance, and Psychologist, Dr. Marvella Bowman. Welcome to the show. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Good, good, good. And you know, now you have quite the resume. <laughs> Let's start with your professional life as a psychologist. Walk me through that role and your daily responsibilities. Okay, so right now I'm a psychological services coordinator at a state prison in North Carolina. And my day-to-day role includes seeing the offender population for therapy. Um, I also supervise other clinicians, so whether uh, social workers or psychologists at the master's level or doctoral level, and uh, also attending meetings and engaging in some more administrative duties, like making sure clients are scheduled for appointments and um, supervising some of the administrative staff to make sure things are flowing the way they need to. So. Uh, Each day can look very different depending on how many people I have to see versus how many meetings I need to attend um, or if I have supervision hour with a provider. So number of different things. So uh, it's it's hard to say what you do each day, but for the most part, I enjoy seeing the offenders. And so I've taken on a lot of that um, and allowed some others to attend meetings in my place (laughs) because I prefer to see people. (laughs) <laughs> now, what kind of offenders are you seeing? Are you seeing um, manslaughter, you know, felony, or what? What? What kind? They're all felonies at the. So there's very few. It's a. It's. It's a prison. It's not a jail. So the okay. staff and people have been convicted. Um, many are habitual felons for a number of years. Um, I came down here in 2016, and it was a men's prison. Uh, so I was working with male offenders primarily until last year when we switched over to a female prison. So the bulk of my clientele right now are female offenders um, and the crimes run the gamut. Um, I still do work at a male facility uh, at least three times a month. I'll go out there just to kind of offer some coverage. So it's a wide variety of people, a wide variety of criminal histories. Um, you know, never a dull day, we'll put it like that. <laughs> What's the most challenging part of being a therapist? Uh, For me, and I'll just say more generally and not specify it uh, to this population because that has its own unique uh, difficulties. But in general, I think people think that the therapist is supposed to fix you. So, you know, uh, they don't understand that there's work that they have to put into the process and they think they're going to come sit down, dump out all their problems and I'm I don't know what they think we can do, but uh, wave a wand and all of a sudden you'll just not feel depressed anymore. Or you'll not feel um, upset anymore. And that's not necessarily the case. You know, sometimes venting can be helpful and people can feel relief, but people with um, diagnosable mental health disorder, there's more work that needs to be done on the part of the person coming in for therapy and that not understanding that right away can be a difficult um, discussion. Okay, you kind of segue into this, you know, mental health. um, That's really a big part of your treatment. Now, if there's one thing you wish your clients or patients knew about treatment or mental illness, what would it be? One thing definitely about mental illness in general is that it's not your identity. So I've seen a very a large amount of people are very um, comfortable with saying, you know, I'm bipolar or I'm schizo. And that's, that hurts me as a person, because if you think that's your identity, then there's not much to treat. If that's you, who you are, then there's nothing other than that. But, um, and words matter. So even if they can know after having a conversation, like, yeah, I know that's not my identity, 
but because you say it, there's something about saying that and identifying like that that changes how your brain works and the, the permanence that you think that that has in your life. Uh, so you have disorders. You know, with a physical illness, you don't hear people saying, I am cancer or I am the flu. You have that. And the idea is that you can come away without it. So, um, or at least you can manage it in some effective way. Okay. So that concept that this is not your identity, this is an illness you have that's treatable is the biggest thing that I would want people to know coming in. Well, do you feel that people might say that because of society? Um, Absolutely. People do say, it's like saying I'm an alcoholic. You know, you say I'm bipolar. Is it because of people, us in general, we put those titles and so it becomes a part of them. So, you know, is that the first part of the therapy session, you know, without going into details, would you first have to erase that thought that you are not, you know, you're not, bipolar doesn't define you, do you start there? And then, you know, whatever the process is, work your way from that point? So it depends. So if a person comes in already having an existing diagnosis or if they've worked with other clinicians in the past, they might have that type of mindset. And, um, you know, it depends on the actual client and how they utilize it. In the prison population, sometimes uh, people use that as a crutch to make excuses for bad behavior. And so that is often a conversation like, you know, just because you're depressed, that doesn't mean that it makes an excuse for this behavior. Um, however, some people don't come in with the idea that they have any problems at all. So sometimes the beginning sessions, other than, of course, gathering information and making sure that I have an appropriate diagnosis, is just providing that psychoeducation, like this is an issue that's treatable. Here are some different ways to treat it. You may also need to see a psychiatrist to provide medication. And then the therapeutic work will be changing your mindset and your thought processes so that you can move forward. Um, and, you know, there's a difference, especially with alcoholism in particular and any addictive uh, disorders. So I don't particularly treat those. It's not a specialty of mine. But um, in some ways, I think that language, like you said, is something that society did. And there's reason for it. With addiction, there's a lot of denial at first. So being able to say that kind of captures something that's necessary in that respect. But I've never really seen it be beneficial for people to identify as their mental health disorder. Okay. And how have clients' nonverbal cues helped you to make assessments in the past? Uh, so in this current population, there is unfortunately a lot of, uh, and this term is not really used in the field much, but the easiest way to say it is malingering. Um, so when okay, people that... are malingering, so when they're feigning a disorder, so they don't really have it, mm -hmm. but they want you to believe that they have it. So oh, okay. some nonverbal cues uh, could be that very often, and this is one we get a lot in the prison setting, someone is saying that they are schizophrenic or have psychotic symptoms. And some of, you know, we do formal testing in terms of providing a test, but some nonverbal cues will be that typically a person that actually hears voices, for example, you can see some of that in their behavior. So as you're speaking to them, you might hear them attending to something else. However, when people are feigning that, they can have a complete conversation and be focused until you trigger something asking the question and then they put on a behavior. So it's just, it just takes, uh, you know, paying close attention and noticing some of the nuances of people's behavior. And sometimes it takes more than one visit or more than one set of eyes to take a look at what we're seeing to make sure that we're going in the right direction. We would never want to, you know, improperly say that somebody is not being honest about the symptoms they're presenting, but unfortunately it happens quite a bit in the prison setting. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, for me and my culture, um, when we thought, when we would think about therapy or we say seeing a shrink, mm -hmm. um, if you had a problem, they would just say pray <laughs> and, and just hope it goes away and just keep praying until it goes away. And, you know, therapy was seen as expensive and mm -hmm. also, you know, for crazy people are a sign of weakness. Now, what's the biggest myth about therapy? Um, there are so many, <laughs> but the one that comes to mind immediately is, and it's probably because of um, media and things that you've seen on TV. We've all seen movies of people lying down on a couch and talking about things, and then it always ends up being their mother that's the problem. 
And that's really not what we do. <laughs> or <laughs> most, most clinicians nowadays do not do that. You know, there's different types of therapy. And I think the one that has the most, um, is the most visible or the, what we've seen for a long time, um, it's probably just because it's easier to show in a movie, is um, psychodynamic therapy. And not too many people do that anymore, or they do elements of it, but that's not the primary form of therapy. The field has moved a lot to um, types of therapies that can be measured that we know that there are outcomes that are beneficial, right? So um, empirically supported therapies. And, huh? No, I was going to say, wait, so there's no more couch? Because, you know, that was one of the things I was looking forward to. Some people may still use a couch, but um, very often, more often than not, what you'll probably find in your average therapist's office is going to be a chair, uh. <laughs> comfortable, and you'll be face to face. Because the thing is, you, we're not ha having a power differential. We're working on this together. So okay. like lying down, you're not in a submissive role and I'm not taking, that's kind of a more medical model, right? Like you go to the doctor's office and you lie that's down true. and you fix stuff, right? But when you're coming into therapy, we're coming to work on this together. So we're going to be face to face, eye to eye. Um, you're going to be sharing some information with me so that I can get a good sense of your history. But my goal is not to, sometimes my goal may not be to identify how something happened or why something happened, right? So I might be able to provide some feedback about that. But therapy nowadays is more so focused on solutions and moving forward. So usually if somebody's asking about your past, it's to get a background, not to identify, oh, this is why you have it. Here it is. It's because your mom didn't hug you enough. I mean, that might be part of it, but that's not going to help us move forward. So um, we take more time finding ways to identify what are patterns of behavior that you're exhibiting now and then finding ways to correct that. Oh, okay. And, you know, I've been following you for a while on um, your social media outlets and you are very passionate about your work and your cause. And what is your inspiration? What, what made you decided I wanted to be a psychiatrist, a psychologist, mm -hmm. and more so working in uh, prison? Right. So very long and winding road, which is it's interesting, but, you know, I mean, I'll have to attribute my inspiration initially, obviously, to my relationship with God and my upbringing. Um, and just having a passion from very early on about those who could not help themselves. So when I entered college, my mindset was that I was going to be a defense attorney, you know, because I wanted to help people that, um, you know, that were being convicted of crimes and getting long sentencing and not having fair representation. But when I went to college, I became interested in, um, well, first of all, I couldn't get into any of the classes because as a freshman, you have the last pick and there were no open criminal justice classes. So they just said, you know, take something you'd be interested in that you'd get good grades in, and then you can, you know, you can always take the bar later on, even if that's not your major. So I took some psychology courses and became very interested. Um, but along the time in college, I ended up thinking I wanted to be more of a professor and teach and um, do research and like examine some of the things. So I be became interested in studying the development of um, problem behaviors and young young adults and adolescents and things like that so i was kind of more research focused at that time but then we had practicum and internship and that's when i got to do clinical work and i fell in love with that so i felt i would be more effective in working directly with people rather than they call it the ivory tower sometimes on um, being in the you know academic institution and doing research so i decided you know let me go into clinical work and directly care for people and my focus was adolescence at the time. I did some, I, my first full-time job after internship was working at a residential treatment facility for girls who, this was basically what would happen before juvenile detention was to try and give them treatment and wrap around services, take them out of their environment that was negative and hopefully give them some good support and get them on their way and back into regular functioning. And then after that, I got work in a, uh, juvenile detention facility for boys and that was kind of where the more criminal justice system um, and seeing how that kind of operated and and seeing how much help was necessary in those areas so when I moved down to North Carolina I actually could not find work with adolescents um, you know I think people would much prefer to work with children and adolescents than adults and the prison system was in dire need of and is still in dire need of uh, therapists so 
I went that route and I've been there ever since. I haven't gone anywhere else. <laughs> Okay. Random question. Um, speaking of TV shows and myths, I just watched um, oh, that movie with Matthew McConaughey and Samuel L. Jackson. I cannot remember it now. A Time to Kill. Okay. And um, would you be one of the, um, the what would you call them, the, the, the uh, expert witness? Would okay. you be called on to be an expert witness? So in this day and age, very unlikely because of the fact that how the system is set up right now, we aren't independent therapists. So my work is under the auspices of the North Carolina Department of Public Safety. So if something were to happen, um, and it would, it would be very serious for me to have to end up in a courtroom. To date, I have not had to go to court and testify on the behalf of or against or anything for any offender I have had, if they call on me, so say an offender submits a lawsuit and identifies my name, I may have to testify and I have done that. Um, and it's definitely not like the movies cause it was like, it was a Zoom, it was pretty much a Zoom call. They don't use Zoom, but it was a, a web okay. call because the offender was still in prison. So we don't all go to a courtroom. It's like this and the judge is in on a screen and the offender- <laughs> Well, that's a good thing. Cause they dug up all of his past, so. <laughs> And we wouldn't share all of that. So because the uh, work that we do is property of the state, I'm not, I don't have the freedom to just tell anyone or even tell the courts, even when subpoenaed, about the content of the therapy. Okay. I can ask some generic questions, but I wouldn't have to dig up, oh, they were born on this day. I would have to tell them they can find the records and review those themselves. Okay. <laughs> just curious. Yeah. Now, with the current uh, pandemic and racial injustice in America and across the globe. We are very fearful and angry. What are some coping techniques that you would suggest to maintain our sanity? A couple of things. Uh, one of the probably the most simple and overlooked is to breathe. Uh, when we get angry and tense, we tend to tighten up and we don't breathe as well. And that stops the flow of oxygen, that often stops the flow of thought, um, and we can do things rational, irrationally um, just because we're angry and we're upset and we're anxious. Um, I've seen and heard a lot of people, the pandemic in and of itself has increased the likelihood that people are experiencing clinical levels of mental health disorders at this time. So then compound that with the tensions going on and the emotions that come from some of the uh, recent current events. Um, people are probably experiencing their first panic attack, their first um, you know, bout of depression, things like that are happening. So one of the best things you can start by doing is breathing. Um, another thing I would always recommend is not consuming so much information. Like we don't need to be on social media, CNN, all the news outlets. You don't need all of that 24 seven. You need to have some time that you separate yourself from that and detach from all the negative information. It's very uncommon that you're gonna get good news on the news. So take some time away from that and find something that's going to make you happy, something that you enjoy doing, something that makes you laugh, whether it's watching something funny, whether it's just hanging out with, uh, in the pandemic, obviously, there's probably not a whole lot of people you'll be hanging out with per se. <laughs> but even if it's this way, even if it's through a Zoom to have a conversation that doesn't come back to that topic area all the time. Um, and knowing when you need to have those conversations and with whom you need to have them, um, a lot of these topics can cause a lot of pain and anger and you might go in thinking you're going to have a calm conversation and get frustrated and angry very quickly so think about that before entering the conversation and kind of set some ground rules if you're having um discussing something with a spouse or with children just make sure maybe lay some ground rules first about what's going to be okay to say and do in this conversation and what's not and safe words things if somebody says you know pencil it's time to, we're going to just stop the conversation for now and step away from it. That, and that's always have, always do something that, have access to something that you enjoy, um, that you find some mastery in, that you feel good about, just so that um, it gets easy to get bogged down by a lot of what happens in our lives without any of the extra going on. So just have something that you enjoy that you can do, whether it's simple as turning on some music that you really like, um, or doing something nice for yourself, like giving yourself a, a bath. So just something that you enjoy 
and can do well, that you're not struggling to do and figure, I need to figure out how to do this in order to get it right. No, make it something that you can do with ease that gives you joy. Yeah, and, and speaking of enjoyment, um, we're gonna lighten this up. We've been speaking a, a lot, heavy topics. Um, when you're not treating patients, what do you do for fun? Okay, so the pandemic has kind of shut down a little bit of the fun that I might Social have distancing enjoyed. fun. Right, the social <laughs> distancing, it's not as easy, but I really do enjoy dancing. Um, you know, that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I haven't been doing it as much because of a lot of different reasons, but uh, there was a time when, you know, me and some friends would go teach dance to different community groups or perform at um, well, not really perform, but minister at churches and different events. It's not a church, you know, the, I think the last public event wasn't a church event, but um, just different occasions like that. Right now, we're not doing that per se, but even just to get up and choreograph a song I like in my house, that's fine. I'll do that on occasion. Um, and if I'm not doing that, I really did enjoy attending church and my church is awesome. So we can do a lot of online things and they're actually, we're doing church in the parking lot this Sunday. So I'm very excited to see some folks that I haven't seen in weeks. So for me, that's fun. Make sure you have your mask. <laughs> oh, I have about five masks <laughs> that I change, I interchange. Well, wait, did you say write, write, I heard you say write in songs and then choreograph into it. Are you also a songwriter? Did no. I miss that in my intro? So no, I'm not a songwriter. I just say finding a song that I like. I have written songs in the past, but I don't know if they're any good. But, <laughs> but um, no, I used to. <laughs> so I'll send them to you. Then. <laughs> if I can find them, they're from years and years ago. But um. <laughs> I just find a song that I like. It might be something meaningful, something, um, you know, uplifting and just do some choreography to it, make something up, just, you know, something enjoyable. That's good. That's good. That's, that's good. And it's good that you're able to go to back to church, even if it's um, in the parking lot. Um, we're having a six people, well, four people, including us, so six people, because we're only allowed in the UK right now, you can have six people in the backyard, two meters apart. Oh. So we're going to do that on Friday, have a, a six people barbecue nice. in the back. And I'm looking forward to it. And like you mentioned, for me, karaoke is one thing that I love to do. I got that the box and everything for my birthday with the flashing light. And so that's I something that, that I do. <laughs> <It's my job. laughs> <laughs> you need to post us that for us so we can see it. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that's something that I do, and I probably do it after this, as you said, because it helps to kind of ease some of the tension and the anger and with all that's going on. So I actually said, I said, when I'm done with this, I'm going to go turn on my karaoke machine and listen to some Whitney Houston and some yeah. other songs. So you know, that's a that's a great point and that's true. Um, now, I mentioned in your intro, your book, I wanted to also talk about that. It's titled Content, Consistence and Conformed. Yeah. Right? Um, yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about this book and um, why? why, what was the inspiration behind it? Yeah, so that book, um, it's a devotional, it's a book of devotional. So the, it's a very long title, right? So content consistent and conformed is like the first part. The second part is just uh, a book of devotions for uh, the believer with a heart after God. In fact, the initial inspiration for the book, I didn't write it all in one sitting. It came from years and years of me sending different emails to different groups. So like my family and friends, uh, people in a, a choir that I was in in college, like it was really, it came from collecting those. I used to post some of them on social media, like when Facebook, when I first was introduced to Facebook and they had notes, if anybody remembers that. <laughs> I used to put them up there. So at one point, I don't even remember when this was, I just decided to like take down the notes and collect all of them and put them in a book. And it was literally just sitting in my, um, sitting in my computer, like sitting there in my Google Drive, just there. <laughs> I never really edited it. I just put it together and left it be. Um, then I took a class, a mentorship class with a woman named Nakia Shai, and she does mentoring. Um, she's also a liturgical dancer and a minister in a lot of other capacities. So um, I know her from the dance world, the dance ministry that I was a part of. And she had a class about basically um, finding your purpose. And 
I, that's something I had put on the shelf. Looking back, thinking back to my childhood, I always did think about being a writer, but I never really acted on it. Like I had little snatches of things written um, and hanging around and it just kind of, eh, that's not what I'm doing anymore. I'm a psychologist and I write research articles and that was it. So I kind of put it, that was a very old dream, but we, as a part of the class, it was, okay, what is it that God had put in you that you just haven't allowed to come forward? And part of the class was, okay, you need to publish that book. So <laughs> that's how the book came about. Um, and I just released it in March. It's now available on Amazon. So anybody can search for it there and get it. Um, and, you know, it's the, the content of it is topical. So very often you'll have devotionals that are like for each day of the week or each day of the year. It's not that. It's basically by topic. So some okay. is about the basics of your walk with God. Some is about um, dealing with difficult times. And then there's a section that's about seasons. So like Thanksgiving season, Christmas okay. season, things like that. So you can pick it up for years to come at any point in your life. You don't have to read it cover to cover, but you can just pick it up at any point. And what applies to me right now? Okay, this looks like something I should read today. And that is how I would hope people will interact with the book. Okay. okay. Well, we'll definitely have the information on our site um, when we post um, the video. But also, so there's something in it for everyone. Yes. So it doesn't matter what my faith is, if I am um, Catholic, Jewish, although Jewish is pretty um, Christian, it's, it's something, there's something in it for everyone. Yes, right? and I mean, it's definitely geared towards the Bible and Jesus, so if there's anybody that's opposed mm -hmm. to that, they might be like, but it's not pushing anything, so it's, yeah, it's saying, yeah. if you choose to believe this, or if you choose to look into it, here's mm -hmm. some things that can encourage you and uh, show you where to go, just gives you scripture to focus on, and uh, just some thoughts, some of my thoughts, but it's all related back to scripture, and there's, a, there's scriptures for each devotional that it points you to read before you read the actual devotional, and then afterwards, just kind of surrounding that time with biblical foundation. So that's great. That's great. And especially, you know, in a time like this, it's good to have something that can give you hope. So congratulations on your book. And like I said, I'm definitely going to post your information on our site. So whoever would like to pick up a copy, they can do so. Thank and, you, you know, Wrapping this up, what advice or what are the steps involved in becoming a psychologist like yourself? It, it, it seems like it's a lot because when people hear the word doctor, like, oh my God, it's daunting. I don't, <laughs> I don't think I can do that. If you could just explain to us, I know how you, you were saying earlier how you got there, but if me, um, I'm interested, I'm a young kid, and I'm interested in becoming a psychologist and help people like you do, what would you say to me? Okay, so it's a couple of different things, and some of it depends on where you are, right? So by location, um, currently in North Carolina where I am, you can be a master's level psychologist and see patients and do just about everything that I do um, without the doctorate. So it's not that you have to get your doctoral degree. Okay. And if you're interested in therapy or certain types of work, you might be fine with a, a social work degree. It doesn't have to necessarily be psychology. Um, but that differs in every different state, just about, uh, in the States here. And I have no clue what it's like in the UK, <laughs> but what I did, <laughs> what I did was I went to, um, you know, kindergarten through 12th grade. Then I went straight to college. I took a gap year and did some work as I applied for graduate school, went to straight into a PhD program. So there are differences as to whether or not you can go and get a master's in something and then go back and get your PhD. I ended up going into what they call a, a terminal PhD program. So the master's, I got it along the way, but I couldn't really do anything with that master's. Like I had to finish my program in order to begin to practice in New York at least. So, um, so, Technically, what graduate school is supposed to be is four years of coursework and practicum sites, a year of internship, and then, well, you, if, in best case scenario, you do your dissertation before you go to internship, and then you're good. Um, I did not go that route. <laughs> it took me a little while to get my dissertation done. It was focused on uh, African-American youth primarily and uh, the development of problem behaviors uh, and 
looking at racism as its impact on those develop that development of that type of behavior. So it took some time to get the population up to the point where I could have measured it and things like that. So um, I did my four years of coursework. I didn't match with an internship my first year. So I taught in the college setting. Um, I did end up matching, but then I had to go back and complete my dissertation. So I did that. Uh, so it took me about a total of from the beginning of graduate school to the end when I actually graduated after defending my dissertation and doing all I needed to do, it took a total of eight years. So it doesn't have to, <laughs> if your research topic is one that doesn't require as much as what I did, then you can be out in five. Um, but I took an eight year route and um, after you get your doctorate, you also need to get licensed. So it usually takes some time to study for the test, uh, which is called the EPPP in psychology. I can't even tell you at this point what that stands for, but it's basically the national it's okay. exam. <laughs> <laughs> it's a national exam. We all have to take it. Different states have different levels that you have to pass by to be licensed in that state. Um, and then each state has its own test. So, you know, a little more things to do, but I was fully licensed in 2014, I believe. So I graduated with my doctorate in 2012 and then got my licensing in 2014, I believe. And that was in New York. Um, I moved down here in 2016, got licensed down here. All I had to do was take the state test, which was not difficult. Um, and this is where I am. So that's kind of the path. And so what I would tell people if they're interested in um, therapy, for example, just find out what you're interested in doing. I think my path was so winding because at first I wanted to be a researcher and a teacher and all of these things. But in that time, I was able to do each of the things I thought I wanted to do and recognize that, nope, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> so um, research and look into what you want to do and what you want your path to be to get there. With the oh. PhD, I have a bit more freedom, but it's not a necessity. So I'll often tell people, and I know people who have dropped out of PhD programs because they really just wanted to work with people and there's a long time that you might have to go through before you get to do that independently. So a master's level, in psychology or social work may be a better route. It just depends on what you want to do and what you want to be able to have the freedom to do when you're done. Okay, great, great advice, great advice, because I would think that you need a PhD. <laughs> I didn't know you could do it just with the master's alone. So that's the first thing that I was thinking. So um, I don't think I'm going to be a psychologist at this point. <laughs> But that's 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 great. That's great advice, and that's great to know. Someone out there might be listening, and they're interested in the program, and they're thinking you need to do that because that also requires more money. So right. if they're able to do it with the masters. You know, the financial burden that's another thing as well. Uh, so you definitely, like you're saying, make sure that what you want to do that it does require that. Absolutely. Now, you have given us a lot of information. Um, and so this might be hard for you, but I'm going to ask you in 15 seconds or less, tell me out of all the information you just gave, what my biggest takeaway from our conversation should be. Hmm. I'm going to say, and this is a more, I think it can apply to anything, whether it's um, the field you're going to go into, or if you're seeking mental health uh, treatment for yourself, is that at the end of the day, like you are the only one who can change you. You're the only one who can, you have that power to change yourself, to do what you want to do, but you don't have to do it alone. So if you need a therapist or if you need a mentor in terms of professional um, life, or you need just some spiritual assistance, you don't have to do anything in life alone, but you are the one who has, has the power to make the change that you desire to make. Thank you. Great advice. In the in the words of the late great Michael Jackson, make that change. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Exactly. Make that change. <laughs> Dr. Bowman, thank you so much again for um, coming on the show and just gracing us with your presence and just giving us all of this information. And thank you to everyone out there that continues to support the show. And please remember to com to comment like and subscribe below and tune in next week as we will have a very special guest who will talk about his journey to success without pursuing higher education as always be safe and god bless thank you